Dr. Harvey, thank you for joining with us today. Let's start off with a quick introduction about yourself and take it on from there. Sure. So I started as a clinician in the NHS and became a consultant radiologist and then went into academia. I spent two years doing a research degree at the Institute of Cancer Research and then branched out into industry where I've worked at two startups in the AI in healthcare space mm -hmm. and I identified a need for bespoke consultancy for multiple strategies in the go-to-market area which include regulations, health economics, intellectual property and patent rights uh, as well as the go-to-market strategy itself. That's been quite a journey, right, from being a radiologist to getting into academia and now helping startups gain market entry. Um, wow, what a journey. So um, can you tell me a little bit about the ECLAIR guidelines? So the ECLAIR guidelines was the result of a bunch of academics and industry professionals who came together to help answer, or at least attempt to answer, mm -hmm. the common sense questions that all hospitals around the world would need to ask of vendors and manufacturers of AI systems when they are considering purchasing such systems. So the ECLAIR guidelines are really um, a list or a sort of templatized version of the kind of logical thinking and due diligence a hospital or healthcare system can do when looking at a specific vendor's claims around a certain product. Dr. Harvey, what are the key things that um, hospitals need to look into when considering an AI vendor? So there's multiple things, and these are laid out in the AirClair guidelines. But in essence, the, the first and most foremost thing is to look at what the manufacturer has on offer as a product in terms of what their intended use is. So they will have told the regulators, we intend this device to be used on a certain population for a certain condition in a certain use environment. And you need to check that that's indeed what you need it to do and what you expect it to do. Mm -hmm. So do ask to see that documentation, um, including the instructions for use on, on how it is actually used um, in that healthcare setting. That's the first and foremost thing. The second thing to consider is benefit and risks, and there is a regulatory document called the Benefit Risk Analysis Matrix, or BRA, it's shortened to. And in that, the manufacturer should have gone through a lot of the pre-expected risks that they hope to be able to mitigate through certain safety procedures and, and design choices, but as well as the intended clinical benefits. So you can ask to see that document and talk through it with a vendor and make sure that it aligns with your thinking on what the potential benefits and risks are. It may be that you find some that weren't included in the original documentation, and that's fine. They can then take that and they can re-edit and they can, when they go for their repeat submissions and audits for regulatory approvals, they can add those benefits and risks in. It's a learning process for everybody at the same time. The third thing to look at is the financial impact or the health economics aspect of, the, of purchasing a system um, that involves AI. And just as for any procurement choice in a hospital, it's the same for AI, there will be an upfront cost mm -hmm. and either potential direct savings mm -hmm. or an improvement or elevation of the quality of care, which will have a health economic value. And the way that you can assess this is by looking at um, an independently or, or sometimes um, professionally done budget impact model or indeed a cost effectiveness analysis which looks at quality adjusted life years mm -hmm. and the saving and expenditure over the entire lifetime of a patient as a result of an intervention by AI at a specific time point. So there are a lot of conversations about health economics and uh, you and uh, Cure, we're working together on some of them, right? So do you want to talk about some of the work that we're doing together? Sure, well Cure have multiple products um, and each one needs to be considered in a slightly different light, they plug into different pathways. And each pathway has to be analysed with a health economics lens in a slightly different way. And so what we're doing with Cure is we're looking at the different products and the different pathways that they lie in. We're trying to model out what are the financial impacts of changing those pathways with each of Cure's products and how that will hopefully improve either quality of life or the financial impact and cost savings on those NHS trusts using those products. Working with so many startups and their AI products, what do you think the trend is going to be as far as AI is concerned in healthcare? So I think AI is going to fundamentally change the way we deliver certain aspects of healthcare, particularly the data-driven specialities like radiology, ophthalmology and pathology. And that's because it is a data-driven um, technology. You have inputs in, in data formats which are then analysed by these large neural networks and they have data-driven outputs. Um, but I think we need to be cautious and realistically pragmatic about the speed uh, at which we need to deploy these. We're still extremely early. We need um, a longer period of prospective validation 
we need to really understand the financial impacts, the potential uh, benefits and risks. Uh, we need to get the patient and public involved more. Um, and we need to take our time and do it slowly. Mm -hmm. We should not move fast and break patience. Thank you, Dr. Harvey. It has been a pleasure speaking with you. Lovely catching up. Thanks for having me.